is a joy to be with you this morning and bring you greetings from uh, Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary as well as Covenant Community OPC in Greenville. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. years ago used to say that for the Christian, every bush is a burning bush. All ground is holy ground. And therefore, every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Not to diminish the celebrations of man on earth, but rather to elevate everything we do. It is a privilege to be here this morning. And as we come to God's word this morning, you can begin to turn to uh, the book of 1 John. A few things to note before we read. First, there is a purpose in our worship. We've had the privilege this morning of being called to worship by our God and then confessing what we know to be true, confessing our sins. And as we come to his word, we need to be mindful that while we are broken, we are sinful, we have a victorious Lord, a Lord who has not just acted and then left, but is ever present with us and is present with us primarily through his word. So as we come to it this morning, we have the privilege as well as the duty to give our full attention to the joy that's presented here. So in doing that, let us turn to 1 John. I'm going to read from uh, chapter 1, 1 all the way through to chapter 2, verse 14. So it's a lengthy reading section, but I'm doing that because I want you to hear what the Spirit is saying through the Apostle in its context. Before we do that, let us pray. O oh God, our Father, what a privilege to be called children of the living God. And so, Father, we come to you this morning. We come to you truly with nothing in our hands but the joy that uh, comes from knowing we belong to Jesus Christ. We confess that we fall short in every possible way, and yet we take comfort in the promises that you have granted us. As we come to your word this morning, I pray that you would grant unction to your servant, that your spirit would go forth, and that you would likewise give ears to hear to all of us, that we might know you, that we might be drawn together in Christ and in his spirit, that we might be grown and warmed to the truth of your gospel, and that the name of Christ might be broadcast throughout this land through your people whom you have elected for yourself. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. First John, beginning in chapter 1, verse 1 through 2.14. This is the word of God. Listen to it. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 
He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Beloved, I am writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away. And the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I am writing to you, little children, Because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, or I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. And I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. This is the word of our living God. Well, imagine with me for a moment. Some of you may have to put a little more work in this than others, but that you're at finals week taking an exam. For some of us, that's very near. I trust all of us have had a similar experience. And in taking your exam, you go through the whole process, and as you exit the exam room, the flutters you had from taking the exam give way to relief that it's over. And then suddenly, your memory begins to kick in, perhaps a little better than it did while you were sitting in the room. And as your memory comes back to you, you start to have that nervousness again. Did I answer number three? Did I actually go back to that one I meant to go back to? And as this nervousness begins to build, your classmates come out into the hallway, and as you begin to reflect and perhaps commiserate, as the case may be, you suddenly realize you were completely off base on the majority of your test. And the striking realization comes that you will fail. Panic. The only way to describe that is straight out panic. And I wonder... I wonder if you have felt this type of anxiety. Maybe not so much in regard to a test, but perhaps in those things in life that are a bit more important, things that are outside of your control, things that you thought you had under control, things you never saw coming. And I wonder how many of you have felt this type of anxiety specifically in regard to your spiritual life. You see, uh, in regard to our spiritual life, we must examine ourselves by what we know to be true and who we actually are. And this is where John leaves the readers to his letter right before our passage. You heard over and over again that if you know him, you will keep his commandments. If you know him, you will love the brothers. If you really have him abiding in you, 
you will walk as he walked. This is a heavy burden laid upon the church by the apostle. And their response, he anticipates, is panic. We often find ourselves wondering what we will do before a holy God. How do we answer this? Well, that's what John uh, brings us to today. The saints have been confronted with a standard of conduct that necessitates a self-examination that they will indeed fail. And God's perfect law of love has been applied as a standard of their conduct. So he asks them, are you in the light or are you in the darkness? But you see, these frightened believers' need is the same as ours. And they have the same need that we have, which is we need some reason not to panic. When we stand before our God, recognizing who he is and the magnitude of all that he has done and all that he has been uh, maligned by, we need some reason, some assurance that we don't need to panic. And that's what this book is about. It's about assurance in the face of our sin and our need in this world. And John pastorally comes to all the churches. This letter was written as a sort of a circular letter to the churches. And so it's for all of us, both then and now. And so as they are being confronted with the beauty and grandeur of this holy, pure, and spotless God, before whom they stand in filthy garments, John comes to them and he says, My children, my children, do not fear. There's no need to panic. And his central point in the few verses that we will look at today, 12 through 14, is the reason you don't need to panic is because it's not in your hands. The triune God is the one who redeems you, who perfects you, and who gives you victory in Christ Jesus, our risen Lord. God himself redeems you perfects you, and has given you victory. And so we're going to look at that in those three sections, being redeemed, being perfected, and victory. But to do this, we need to pull apart the text just a little bit. So if you look at, with me in your Bible, you'll notice, at least probably in most of your Bibles, this particular passage sort of looks different than the rest. It looks almost like a, maybe poetry or a song, and there's a reason for that. John has structured this for a very particular purpose, to convey his pastoral concern and, and support for these people. There's really two sets of stanzas here, stanzas here, if you'll notice. He first addresses the children, then the fathers, then the young men, and then the children, and then the fathers, and the young men. So if you're a writer in your Bible, you can actually draw a line right um, above the second address to the children, because this is two parallel passages in which John is repeating, but also emphasizing and increasing the, um, the emphasis for, uh, for the believers. And we'll talk a little bit more as we go through just how he does that. But he will address these same groups over and over again. So we need to, we need to talk about who these groups are. And so first he addresses the children. He says, little children, or I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Now, a side note, this is actually one of the several proof texts in this, this book for the Heidelberg Catechism, question number one. And you'll see that as we go, that that summary also summarizes much of what John has to say to us. But he says, I'm writing to you because... Your sins have been forgiven for his name's sake. Now, who are the children he's addressing? Are these covenant youth? Are they new believers? Are they um, just those who perhaps are a little immature? Who are these believers? And I would suggest to you that it's sort of a yes and. It's all of those combined. John is coming as a, a father in the faith. 
He's coming as one who cares about the church and is addressing them as children because they are young in their faith. But he is also doing that because what he's going to lay out first is a very foundational truth. The thing that we begin with as believers, the ground floor, you might say, that all of our assurance is based on, that which the newest of believers must grip onto as the only hope in life and in death. And that is this, that uh, your sins are forgiven or forgiven you for his name's sake. When we face a holy God, our panic is created by the fact that we are sinful, that we are dirty, and that we have nothing that we can do about it. And what this is telling us is, what John is telling them is, you have forgotten what the basis of the gospel is. You have been forgiven. Standing in front of God at the court bench of justice, if you were to stand by yourself, you would indeed fail. But you are not there by yourself. In chapter 2, verse 1, he says, "You or actually verse 2, he says, you have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus the righteous. And so he's telling them, you don't stand there by yourself. You have Christ standing right next to you as your advocate, as your lawyer, as it were. And rather than merely arguing your case, because your case is sort of lost, right? He says, I will pay what this one owes. Put it on me. And standing next to you, he takes off his robes, his princely robes, his robes of sonship, and he puts on your tattered, filthy, torn garments and is led away to pay your penalty. But in his stead, he has left his robes of righteousness with which you are covered. And this is more than just a displacement of punishment, isn't it? What is it that our catechism tells us? When we think about having our, our sins uh, forgiven, the legal term for this is justification. And the Shorter Catechism 33 says that that justification is, first of all, an act of God's free grace, wherein he pardoneth all our sins for the sake of Christ, and accepteth us as righteous in his sight. This is elementary for many of us. But just think about that for a second. Knowing your sin, how can you be accepted as righteous? It is a truth that staggers the imagination. But you are accepted as righteous because of the righteousness of Christ that's given to you when you receive him by faith alone. You are declared innocent at the judgment of God because of what Christ has done for you. This is what John wants you to understand. He says, there is no need to panic. You are righteous. By faith in Christ, your sin is wiped out and gone. You are declared innocent and righteous and in that, his name, it says, it says for his name's sake, his name is emblazoned upon you. And all of the pleasure that God looks on his own son with, the one he declared from heaven, in him I am well pleased. All of that pleasure is placed on you. Do you think of that? Do you think of God looking on you with pleasure? And that's really what the second address to the children is. If you come down to uh, verse 13, where it says, I write the end of verse 13, where it says, I write to you children because you know the Father. That's what John is getting at. Now, he does something kind of interesting here. As I read, you may have noticed, I, I, I read it as I have written to you. And the reason for that is, 
doesn't come across exactly in English. But what John starts with is, he says, indeed, I am writing to you, children, because your sins have been forgiven you. But then when he addresses them again, he changes his tone and says, I have written. And what the intent of this kind of a structure is, is it's like when you're with your own kids and they're beyond consoling. And you get down on their level and you look them in the eye and you say, hey, calm down. Listen, I'm talking to you. And then, quite often, there's a second time when you may need to sit next to them, put your arm around them, and say, hey, listen to me. That's what John is doing here. From, in going from I'm writing to I have written, he is giving the impression that he is stepping out of the time from when he was writing the letter into the time they're reading it. Saying, listen, let me tell you why I wrote this to you. Because you know the Father. You have my name on you. You have been given all of the rights of the children of God. You are more than innocent. You are more than justified. You are loved as a child. And that's what our standards also say about adoption. It says that adoption is an act of God's free grace whereby we are received into the number, the number of his family, And given a right to all the privileges of the sons of God. Does that stagger your imagination? Well, it's not imaginary. This is the foundation that John builds with the church. He says, this is what your hopes sit on. This is what defines you as a believer in Christ. You are innocent and you are a child. And so through his name... Through Christ's name, you have been drawn into this fellowship that he mentions at the beginning of the book. This fellowship in which he says, we have seen and heard this. And this was significant for the church then because they were dealing with a lot of Greek philosophy that had come in that basically said, you know, what you do in the flesh doesn't really matter. All flesh, all material things, all that's, all, you know, all that's bad anyway. All you need to worry about is the eternal state and what you're thinking about spiritually. And so it sort of led to this, live how you want, just profess the right thing. And what Jesus is saying is, no, look, Christ was really here. He really came and died in flesh, just like yours. And it's that that gives you hope. And because that's what gives you hope, it therefore matters what you do with it. It matters how you live. And so he's saying, as he said earlier in the book, my children, I'm writing this so you won't sin. But if you do, your standing doesn't rest on your actions. It rests on this foundation that you are righteous and loved by a holy God. How much further do we need to go? That's a lot to just wrap ourselves around right there. What does it mean to you to be a child of God? What does it mean to you when you're outside these walls? When you're faced by the just doing of life, just making it, just getting along. What does it matter to you that you are identified as a child of God? And for that matter, is this your hope? Is this your foundation? Can you say, as the catechism question did, I belong to him. I am defined by him. Regardless of whatever else comes, this I know. John says to you, don't panic. The Lord, the risen Lord, has fully satisfied for all your sins. And without the will of your heavenly Father, not so much as a hair can fall from your head. That says a lot, Pink. But literally, not a hair can fall, which means not a dime can fall from your checkbook. 
Not a shingle from your house. Not a blade of grass from your yard. Not a child from your home. Can fall without his knowledge. Without his purpose. Without his promises. I belong to my Savior. This is our first hope. So what sort of response ought this to inspire? If not, reckless abandon. Take it all. Let me just live here. But he doesn't stop there. He then says, I'm writing to you fathers. And notice that his address to the fathers is identical in both the 13th and 14th verses. It's the only one out of the groups that it's identical in both. And the reason for that is because there's not much more to say. The emphasis is by way of repetition. And what does he say? I write to you, I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. Notice he goes from the child to the father. There are fathers in our congregation, certainly biological fathers. But God has given fathers to the congregation for very particular purposes. And they aren't all men in office. It actually is a bit of a gender-neutral term. So we could probably read this a little bit more like the older or more mature saints. I'm not calling anyone old. I'm just saying. The more mature saints. Those who have been walking upon this foundation through life. And I know many of you have not had necessarily the most straight and um, calmest of paths to walk in this life. Pain, loss, challenge, difficulty, failure, they lie all over our paths. And the encouragement to the fathers here is, first of all, to, con to confirm, I'm writing to you, fathers, because in spite of it all, you know him who is from the beginning. Why does he mention from the beginning? Why doesn't he just say Christ? I mean, we know John is, sees, the, him as, sees Christ as the one who was from the beginning, who was in the beginning, who was the word, who was God. Why does he qualify it as the one who is from the beginning? Because he's highlighting the enduring faithfulness of God to his people. Throughout the entirety of time, he never moves his eye from his people. And the fathers or the older saints in the, in the congregation, in the church, they have seen this play out. And he's saying this to them not only as a confession of it, but he's saying this to them also as an encouragement because what else comes with a life of challenge and trial? But discouragement. There are days I don't think I can take another step. I don't know how I'm going to go forward. And what he says to you is, I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him, who's been from all the way at the beginning. You are not alone. This is not novel in the history of my people. I am here and I see you. He writes to the fathers as both an encouragement and a testimony to his faithfulness across time and across generations. And so that, first of all, highlights the need for those of us who are in that place. And make no mistake, Almost all of us are in a position of being a little bit farther down the path than someone else. And what this tells us is, is that the way we walk, our walk, has real impact, not only for our own relationships with God, but also for our brothers and sisters. Who are in need of encouragement too. Who need to know they're not going to perish in the difficulties, who need to know that there's, a, there's an end to which we're walking together. I mean, this is the great call for discipleship within the church right now. 
But notice how Paul does this. His tone throughout the whole thing is so fatherly and so loving. My children, my children. You know, the, the reality is, is these churches were full of sin and corruption and false teaching. And he'll get to those things. But he doesn't come to them with you brood of vipers. That's reserved for unbelievers. He comes to them as my children, my loved ones, my precious ones. So our first lesson from that is how we are to live our lives in the midst of our brothers and sisters. But secondly, we see here that in God's faithfulness, he deepens and broadens his fellowship with us. That belonging that we have as our foundation ends in a life that has been battle-tested. And that in those testing periods, we are brought to rely and trust in him in deeper and broader ways. We heard this morning in Sunday school about how our trials bring us to our knees and bring us to our Savior in ways that we never would have come on our own. How often with our own children do we do things that they really don't care too much for? But it's for their best interest. Will not our Father do the same for us? And if you take a second and, and look around you, do you not see that in the saints that have gone before you? Do you not see those who have obviously seen something in life and also seen a deepening depth and beauty to their faith that you long to have as your own? And if you sit here today saying, I'm not sure I know them that well. Well, here's some motivation. Because we are designed to live in communion with each other as we commune in Christ. And this is the way in which he encourages us and motivates us to greater and greater faithfulness in the midst of of our failings, in the midst of our challenges. And so John here has given us a, a spectrum view from the foundation of our faith to the goal, the hope, the end to which we're traveling. This ongoing fellowship and relationship that's being perfected. You know, in Hebrews, the author to the Hebrews says in chapter 10, he says that by a single offering, Christ has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. In one sense, we have already been perfected by the work of Christ. But in another sense, that perfection is working itself out as we travel this road and are the benefits of his, the Spirit's sanctifying work in our lives. And assurance comes from being able to look at that and say, I am not where I want to be, but by God's grace, I am not where I was. Even if that only means I know 99 more ways not to do things. Every time I fail, God's grace is there to meet me. And this speaks directly to our panic. Directly to it. Because time and time again, don't we have the voice of despair in the midst of our sin saying, you know, pretty soon God's going to get tired of you. What makes you think he wants to hear from you now? Well, this is what can make you think that he wants to hear from you now because he has poured everything out into his son so that not only do you have the foundation of righteousness and sonship in his home, but you have the testimony of the church around you, of a God who has pardoned all sin, who always stands ready to hear the confession of his people and is always there to chasten, to grow, to nurture you. And so we encourage one another with God's faithfulness in the midst of our trials. And this fellowship, this encouragement, this results in the pursuit of a life of joy in the reality of what God has accomplished for us. How many times have you put your arms around a brother or a sister? You said, I know this is hard. 
Get your eyes up. Look at your Savior. Let's go. Remind, reminds me of Pilg- uh, Christian in Pilgrim's Progress. And his friendship with faithful, and as he goes down the road, constantly pointing people forward. That's our life. That's our life. And we see that as John gives us a picture from childhood to fatherhood. But then he addresses the young men who are in the battle. And again, this isn't addressed just to men. What John is doing is he's saying, here's the foundation. Here's your hope, your goal, the place to which you're traveling, the testimony of those who have gone before you. And now let's talk about the battle that you're engaged in right now. The one that brought you to tears last night. The one you thought you had licked a couple nights ago. And this is what he says. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. Do you hear the screaming how after that? I do when I read that. How have I overcome? Do you see the mess that's in the wake of the, my last week? But that's why John saves us till the last. Because we've already been pointed to the fact that our standing before God is not on the basis of our merits. And this is a process to which you are traveling. And so he now comes to the young man and says, I know you're in a battle with the deceiver. You are to battle. But you have overcome. Think of Joshua. What is... What does God say to Joshua when he takes over from Moses in the very first chapter of the book that bears his name? Be strong and courageous. Why? Because I have given you every piece of land on which you will walk. See, his courage and his strength wasn't to rest in his own capacity or military prowess, but to rest on the promise that God is the one who will fight the battle. You are the one to be faithful Be strong and courageous knowing that I am your very great reward. I am the one who goes before you. We see this in Hebrews 11 in that long roll call of faith. It comes toward the end and he says, all these were made strong in weakness. You got that big long list of people who took cities and overcame great odds. Why? Because... They were made strong out of weakness, not because they strengthened themselves, not because they were chosen just so that they might be stronger than others. They were made strong in their weakness. And Paul exhorts us to do the same. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And what follows? Buckling on the armor of God. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. And then he steps forward. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong. But he doesn't leave it there. You are strong. And the word abides in you. What does it mean to have the word abide in you? And is this separate from strength? Well, look quickly. Just You can just look a little farther in this chapter, verse 24. Where he says, John says, Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will what? Then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. The word abiding in you is the life in which you live as a child of God. It means that you take what he has said, 
what he has done. And you make that the basis upon which you act, the very thing we've been discussing. But more than that, think with me for a second. How did Jesus, or how does the scripture portray Jesus as he is battling Satan? How does he answer him? Each and every time with the words of scripture. He doesn't speak on his own. He speaks God's words, his own words. I, I suppose you could make that distinction. We won't get into the <laughs> how the hypostatic nature works with all of that. But the point is, he uses the word of Scripture to defeat the evil one. But I would suggest that this is more than just the words of Scripture, because we can be tempted to think, well, then we'll just, you know, we'll make sure we've got our memory of work done and say the right things to each temptation. I'm not saying that those are without merit, but... There's a greater truth at bear, to coming to bear here. Having the word abide in you is more than merely the written word committed to memory. Rather, the word is the decrees, the expressed, revealed decrees of God dwelling within your heart. In other words, God has declared you will be victorious. God has declared that you are forgiven in his son. God has declared that the evil one is put underfoot. And Christ, when he hung on the cross and said, it is finished, it is done. He declared your victory. The word abiding in you is the heart's fixed attitude and conviction that what God says is, will, and always shall transpire. And my place in that as a son is unmovable. In Christ, you stand on the foundation of Christ's perfect righteousness. In Christ, you are daily being perfected by the work of the Holy Spirit and by the will of your Father who has made you an heir, an heir to the eternal kingdom and one in spirit with the King of all creation. And in Christ, you are a conqueror, assured of victory, and based, based on the merit and the irrevocable, irrevocable tongue's getting tangled today, irrevocable <laughs> decree of our king. Is there a greater assurance for your standing, your end, and your victory? Surely not. You are strong because of the life of Christ in you and because this battle is his. Therefore, John says, don't panic. You don't need to panic. Why? Because your faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, has risen victorious from the grave. He's redeemed you from all the power of the devil. There's no battle left to fight in eternity. The only battle left to fight is the one that's right here that has already been given to the Lord. Already been won. You are strong in his might and his word abides in you. Well, I can hear perhaps from my own heart but also because I know some of you. <laughs> some of the arguments that come up. Maybe not arguments discussion. You don't know how far gone I am, you might say. Surely there can't be a reasonable hope for someone like me. My heart is cold. I, I really do want to know these truths, but I have seen no change in my life. I'm ready to give up. I understand, and so does your Savior. But I have to ask you this question. 
Do you really believe that you are a more talented sinner than Jesus is as a Savior? Will the creature surpass the creator in power? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why are you leaving me this way? Why have you made me this way? See, when you believe the lies of Satan, that's what they are. When you believe the lies of Satan and your own sin over scripture and the testimony of the living God, then you're calling God a liar, just like our previous text told us. So I have to ask, is that really what you believe? Because the truth is, God's own testimony is contrary to those feelings, as, as understandable as they may be. As much as I understand the despair that can come, it is contrary to God's testimony for your life. So what do you do with a cold heart? Well, you see, despair is not just sadness. It is sad, but it isn't just sadness. Despair, rather, is really a form of panic that also tends to hide a deeper rebellion. What do I mean by that? You see, the inner rebellion that says God can't be trusted farther than my own perception is a tool that Satan uses to make you believe you are worse off than anyone who came before you and there is no hope. But what God has said is that he saves the chiefest of sinners, that he paid for all sin, indeed sin of the entire world. He has said, that you are victorious. If he, as a faithful savior, as a victorious savior, if he can take on the sin of the entire world and bear the eternal wrath of a perfectly just God, is your sin too great for him? Is your heart too hard for him? Certainly not. So I want to encourage you, don't remain in that place, but turn to him. Break my heart. Let go of the anger that is inside. Recognize that your Savior's challenges in your life have everything to do with his love and design for you. There is no arbitrary suffering in this world. There is no meaninglessness in this world. It is all designed for your good and his glory. Fill your mind and your heart with the truth of who God is. You see, when we're caught in panic and despair, what do we do? We fill our eyes and our ears with all of our internal dialogue about why things are hopeless, why this is awful. And those, those things may be true to a degree. But the answer to it is to fill your mind, your eyes, and your ears with the things that God has said is true in spite of it. That's what John is doing here. He's reminding you, this is your foundation. This is your goal. I know the battle is hard. Trust me, I've given you every land that your foot stands upon. It's all yours in Christ. Trust me. But you don't know the pain. You don't know how much this hurts. I can't make it. Maybe I'm not a believer. Maybe I've only thought I'm a believer. And the truth is, is I may not know the pain you're going through. Probably don't. I certainly don't know all of the stuff that goes with it. But here's what I do know. Here's what I do know. Nothing has befallen you that is not common to man. Now, we use that sometimes to make it 
sort of sound like, well, just, you know, pick yourself up. Other people got it worse. And that's not what's being said here. Quite the opposite. If your suffering is real, if your pain is real, but it is not novel and you are not alone, that's the point. Nothing has befallen you that is not common to man. And that means that there is a remedy to that struggle. But the only remedy that comes to that struggle is found in Christ. Because this world has nothing to offer but to bury yourself in the distractions and the fleeting pleasures that will perish with those who enjoy them. There is no remedy to pain and struggle that really satisfies outside of Christ. And get this. Think about this. When your struggle has done its worst, for that matter, let's look at Christ. No one has suffered more than Christ. He took all that this world and God the Father threw, and when it was done, he stood up. What can the world, of, the, the world and Satan do to that? There's nothing left to do. He stood up, and then he rose to the throne in heaven, from which he governs every aspect of your life. And more than that, more than that, because you're united to him, once all of your trials have torn everything apart, and everything feels like it's done, it's done. And you will stand up, because you're in him. Your pain and your suffering is temporary. Real, but temporary. You will stand with him. You will raise with him. Because his life and his decreed ends live in you, you will share in his certain victory. And this is what we do when we think on our risen Lord, whether it's on Easter Sunday or every other day of the year. Our risen Lord is victorious, and we are along with him by his grace. So we face three great enemies of our souls every day. They all cause us to try and panic in the face of a triune holy God. First, our own conscience testifies to our own complete failure before our God. And then secondly, the world assaults us with all the deceptions and the allurements that it has in order to drag us down into the depths of despair and the chains of our own lust. And then Satan, that loud lion of destruction that prowls around, looking literally to devour us. But you see, the reality that man cannot pass the holiness exam of God does not leave us in a state of panic. It need not leave us there. We don't need to panic because the Father has declared you righteous and you have been brought into fellowship with the family of God and are grown in that grace so perfectly that even your most painful trials, your most painful struggles are not used for your destruction. Rather, they are there for your growth and for your good. You don't need to panic because as you travel this life, battling the enemies of this world, our own sin, and Satan, the enemies of our soul, you can fix your eyes on the victorious one already gained in this world, already an established fact. Though you may be, you may be weak, your Savior is strong. And he has declared your victory. And given you every place on which your foot treads. So by him, in him, through his word, and by his spirit, you are equipped with strength for every battle that comes your way. Christian, you don't need to panic. You don't need to panic. So where does this leave us today? Well, panic can have a lot of faces, as we've already discussed. It can look like anxiety. It can look like despair. It can look like anger. It can look like determination to 
fight, to battle, based on my own strength, my own wisdom. But I ask you, what, dear Christian, is your comfort in life and in death? Where will you turn? How will you respond to the voices of sin, to despair? Can there be a more tender promise than what we've heard today? Can there be a more hopeful presentation before us? As we look at as we look at Christ, the victor over sin and death, doesn't, doesn't your heart just want to jump into his arms? Well, do so. <laughs> but if you're not there, if you find yourself doubting, if you find yourself weak, do so as well. Cast yourself on him. Throw yourself at his feet. You can't clean yourself up first. There's no reason to wait. Ham from Easter dinner will wait. Time with your Savior will not. You do not know what your next hour holds. Unless you think I'm only talking to those who may not be believers, I'm talking to every single one of us. We are exhorted every day in the face of our sin to be reconciled to God, to trust these promises, to come to the feet of the risen Savior, to acquire his promises based on what he has said. He is the only one that can break the power of sin and the despair that results. He's the only one who can be an answer to the things we, we don't know what we're going to do about. Whether that be our lives, our kids, our jobs, our, whatever the case may be. He's the only answer. And he's the certain answer. Christian, he has risen. He is alive. His eyes are not shut. His hands are not idle. And he is present with us here today. Your God has fully redeemed you. Do not despair. I beg you, do not despair. Lift your eyes up. Turn now and run to him who saves lost souls and never loses one. Confess now. Confess now. That's what he tells us. Confess. I do not love you as I ought. And remember the heights that he promises to bring us. The heights of glory. Because your victory, Christian, is certain. He has declared it. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you and we praise you for your faithful and trustworthy word to needy people. Father, we have looked at our need today. We have nothing in our own hands. But we rest firmly on the foundation of our Savior. We thank you for the example of our brothers who have gone before us. And we believe that we are victorious in Christ. Fill our hearts. Fill our eyes. Fill our minds with the truth of this word that you have given to us today. Sanctify us by your power. Lead us into all righteousness. And I pray that we might be the sweet aroma of Christ to a world that is in need. For your glory we pray.